in Japan. I'm definitely keen to discuss with you about microservices, continuous delivery, and uh, all things technical. So I'm definitely keen to collaborate with you guys on uh, getting your workloads and applications to the cloud. Now, what I want to begin is with this slide. I, I like it very much. So the title is Software is Eating the World by uh, Mark Andreessen. It's a statement that he made in 2011. So that was five years time for all legacy, all uh, uh, big companies to come to a conclusion and to a reality that software is actually eating the, eating the world. And this picture is the Unicorn Club done by CBS Insights. So these are all the logos of companies that are above one billion dollars. So you can see the time uh, uh, when that company reached that valuation, and you know on the right side, close to uh, today, there's like a big cloud of uh, software companies which are disrupting the industry, and they are not taking it from the newers. They are actually disrupting it from old legacy companies. Now, I would like to also use a statement by Gartner, uh, which mentions that by 2020, there will be 70%, 75% of uh, companies who will build software applications rather than buy them. And this is a differentiator because you cannot build a brand or a, a customer experience with off-the-shelf products. You have to engage with your customers. You have to build on those data insights and fast feedback loop to gain and uh, retain your customers. Now, obviously, uh, there is a cost for that ubiquity. We have now close to uh, 4 billion devices, 4 billion mobile devices, which means that our customers are mobile. They, we have infrastructure which is near free computing code, so we no longer need to uh, wonder or uh, do submit reports that will need to build a data center. We can literally go on the web to Amazon Web Services, or even Pivotal Web Services, and with our credit card, uh, rent computing power, computing storage network power. And I, I would recommend those who do not have an account to go to run.pivotal.io, uh, get a free account, it's two, two months, and you can definitely try the best and uh, uh, of our public hosting platform. Now, we do have a credo, which is we believe that competitive advantage or innovative cost reduction can only come from custom-built software, not packaged application. Because every time you want to do a modification or a customization, you need to have a vendor, a consultant, to uh, send the sales, to walk you through the price, and then you make the modifications, and then you release into production. So you need to build that expertise in-house together with business and we have some really amazing case studies. One of those is Mercedes-Benz for whom we built their uh, bus application. So the application that powers all the new Mercedes drivers on their phone is built together with Pivotal by Pivotal Labs hosted on Pivotal Cloud Foundry all around the world. Another use case is GE Predix. Predix is a predictive analytics platform which which is uh, hosted by General Electric. Last year, together with our uh, chairman, Paul Moritz, Jeff Emil, the CEO of GE, welcomed 2,000 uh, data scientists across the world from different companies to come on that platform to develop the next be uh, best experience for machines. Healthcare, aircraft, all sorts of modules that will tap on the Internet of Things. And, and you already know, I have a smart fridge at home, I have a smart robot, so all those devices have IPs. Even the ERP system in Singapore has an IP, so you can interact with it, you can build insights, you can do very smart things using all of that. Now the problem becomes like, okay, so how often can you release? Let's say you build that custom software, how often can you release it? Is it every week? Is it every day, every hour? Uh, this is a nice example of Wealthfront Engineering, which is a, a robo-advisory company. So they release software every every hour. And they have a dashboard, which is wealthfront.com slash engineering, where they post all the status quo. And if you literally go now, you will be able to see when was their last push to production. 
That's amazing. And it's a $2 billion company, uh, what it used to be, uh, probably more. It's powered by 200 people. So 200 people, including the whole staff. And they are disrupting the private banking and wealth management. And if you think they are very good, Wealthfront is being disrupted by another um, startup, which is called Betterment, with even fewer developers and engineers, with an even higher valuation of $4 uh, billion. So Betterment is another robot advisory, which tells you that software is literally eating the world. And now it's getting to the big companies, Fortune 500. So survival is not mandatory. This is uh, a great code. And if you can look at the Fortune 500 statistics of all companies that exited that list, and you look at uh, the history, some of the companies not only left uh, that index of Fortune 500, they actually went into oblivious. They're gone, no longer. If you remember Kodak, Blockbuster, those companies are gone. So you should begin with an idea in the morning and to start running it in production uh, by the evening. And this is not a quote or something that we think is futuristic. This is actually a quote from uh, Allstate, Andrew Sidney, who uh, changed the way IP and software development is happening at the uh, 150 years old insurance business. Uh, so he gave this on stage on the Cloud Foundry Summit in 2015. If you look at his background, he's a former VP of Cloud at PayPal and a former CTO for JP Morgan. So he has a lot of uh, credibility in the industry and he went through all these principles where he believes it's not enough just to think about software, you need to change the organization. Very much like uh, if you're familiar, familiar with Melvin Conway's law, where if you do have organizations with, uh, that do not talk, within your organization you have two groups of people that do not talk between themselves, or they don't have a very good communication, then the software that they build is going to reflect that organizational structure. So if you want to fix uh, within your uh, department two applications that somehow fail, you know, you fix the organization structure, and the software will fix by itself. Get them communicated. So, you know, you need to go from waterfall to agile extreme programming. You need to change your enterprise tools to open source tools. You need to establish a governance from a governance for everything and a committee decision to empower the innovators. You need to go from monoliths to microservices. You need to go from manual deployment into continuous delivery. I suggest you all look for this video. It's a 20 minutes uh, recording, live on stage. Next, I would like to make a statement about uh, operations as the secret sauce. So this is a blog on Radar or Rayleigh from 2007. These are two identical companies that develop in the same domain, same application. These are two startups. They've done the study uh, by GCP, which is an investor in Silicon Valley. And on the left side, they've done traditional operations. That means that they were still doing manual deployments, configuration management. On the right side, uh, the team has invested in building a platform. And you should know, if you do not have a platform, you either build it or you buy it. The way you deploy your applications production makes your platform. So there's no companies that do not have a platform. They either have uh, a Cloud Foundry-like system or they have a wiki page of 500 easy steps to production. So um, you, you can see that Though you made the investment up front and it took time, you can actually regain, can have an ROI in the long term. So you can spend that time into developing more applications, fixing, talking to your customer, getting the feedback, rather than just babysitting those servers and every time restarting them, updating the software, or doing monotonous tasks. So I think the quote of the year was no CIO told the IT team, good job configuring service. Because this is not differentiating. We need to be building business value. And I'll quickly go into what makes Platform as a Service or Cloud Foundry one of the best uh, places to run uh, your applications and workloads. 
Well, first of all, you, you have these three layers. You have your application code, application platform, and virtualized infrastructure. We do believe that the value is in differentiating the roles. So we'll start with the application developer. So his role is really to create that deployable artifact with his tools. It's not about Docker files or learning a new tool. If he's a Java developer, let him create jars and wars. If he's a PHP, Python, or Ruby, let him do just that. Then we have the platform operations, which are building this massive cluster, this massive data center driven by APIs and driven by software. They monitor the platform, they scale the platform. They think they do more proactive rather than reacting on the and firefighting and responding to mails. And then you have the uh, application operations. So these guys are not your platform operations. They are in the team. This is what we consider the DevOps uh, group. They do configuration for production environment. They deploy the application. They do have the insights on what makes an application and how it works. And they are interested in monitoring the application. They should not go into a server and monitoring what's the patch, what's the logs, where can I find it. They, it's not really about when the CIO asks the IT department, are we making or losing money? They should be able to tell you all of that. How many users, how many uh, requests, what's the health of your system? rather than just, okay, I do not know, but I can tell you the utilization of the CPU to the network. This is really not happening. So with that experience, we can go, here is my source code, run it in the cloud for me, I do not care how. It's not my code, but it's uh, the code of Onsi Fakuri, who is uh, our VP of R&D. So with that, I would like to explain in the next 15 minutes the value line. So we do believe that, you know, there's a red dotted value line in terms of what considers to be you know, useful for the business and what you should not focus at all. So let's begin. You do need an uh, operating system. But does it really matter which flavor of that operating system it is? Like the hardware on which it runs. It's really not a differentiating. Yes, you do need, it does, you do need the, uh, the power, the networking, the, the kernel, everything to host uh, to attach a network or the, the storage. You also need a container orchestration, so that means if you do have a workload, some, some really smart way of scheduling and publishing your uh, containers or jobs across the cloud. You do need some cloud orchestration in order to create those VMs, create networks, create storage, attach uh, the storage in the network. This is really needed because it Though we do have serverless applications, guess what? They run on servers. So you do need all of that, excuse me. But ultimately, it's not that differentiated. And what we do have in Cloud Foundry is this notion of CPI, cloud provider interfaces, which run on all these five uh, big major cloud providers. So next time when you get a new project, ask yourself, so how much value do you get from managing the operating systems? I'll tell you, it's zero. Literally, like you do not get any value. It doesn't do anything for your customers. Your customers will not make a decision between you and your competitor based on your operating system. So you should focus on first principles, and that means everything should be run as a service. Why? Because a service has an API. If you have an API, you can interact with it any day of the week, any hour of the day. It's not a uh, ticketing-based uh, uh, system where we do have a nice front end, but at the end it sends an email and there's a person who has to interact. You should strive to have zero human intervention. You should have all this service automation. And ultimately, but not least, you should think about the multi-cloud platform. Because if, if you have been long enough in the industry, you do remember the days of IBM, when there was only one thing where you could run your workloads. Don't get yourself in the same uh, bucket now with Amazon Web Services. Though it's a great uh, cloud provider, do make a backup strategy. Do not tie yourself to those proprietary APIs. And I definitely suggest you look at the great presentation by Paul Moritz 
uh, the founder of Pivotal, where he believed that there should be an open source operating system for the cloud that will operate with all cloud providers. And that's how Cloud Foundry was developed. Cloud Foundry was developed in open source, and this made it uh, the kernel for contribution. So we do have Microsoft Azure, we have Google CPI, which was contributed by the community. And by community, I mean Google engineers and Microsoft engineers. They started developing those cloud provider interfaces to plug in into Cloud Foundry to be able to run their workloads on those uh, clouds. Because why? The customers asked. And given the open source nature, it was very well welcomed. And developing in open source is very much different than developing in a proprietary world because you cannot have your peer who lives across the ocean in another time zone to, to tap him on the shoulder and say, okay, let's agree on something. You discuss through, tick, through issues, through APIs, through well uh, modularized components. Okay, about the value line. I think the differentiating is if you build custom uh, applications. And that can be, and it's definitely advised to be Java microservices. Why? Because if you continuously want an improvement from the box, this is a great slide which shows Spring Boot downloads monthly. And it's in a never-ending slope. It's almost 4.2 million downloads and, until June. Spring Boot is, is killing the Java EE enterprise. Because first of all, velocity is very important. Spring Boot comes with features like actuator metrics. And I'll have some of my colleagues, uh, Josh, actually giving you a presentation. So I'll not uh, pause that much on it. But ultimately, what I want to say is innovation speed in Java wins. So if you remember the days of WebLogic WebSphere when you would have to provision hours in advance or even ask months to, to just get access to it, now you can run a Spring Boot application in zero to five minutes. Actually, if you use Spring with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot will get you an application from zero to five minutes. It's enterprise Java with dynamic language productivity. You have all the best features of the Spring framework in an auto-configurable fashion where you do a plug and play of all modules and components that integrate with, if you have a NoSQL, if you have uh, a metrics agent. There will be um, a library, a shared component under the Spring <coughs> umbrella in the open source that integrates with all of those. And of course, if you want to deploy in the cloud, there is some orchestration that you need to build in your application, the way how you interact and register microservices. I will just give you a three simple example. Central configuration management, service registry and discovery, and fault tolerance, in-built application fault tolerance. Spring Cloud uh, has an interesting history. It was built together with Netflix. Netflix is uh, the biggest and largest video uh, company in the world. It actually has three times more traffic than YouTube. So if you think YouTube is large, Netflix is even bigger. It dominates the internet in the US and I think now in Asia as well. So what is actually Spring Cloud? I'll just so Spring Cloud, if you're using Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we do have a managed service for you. So we do have a circuit breaker dashboard. We do have a service registration and a configuration service uh, that you just uh, create service, pick up your plan, bind it to the application, and that should work. How many of you are familiar with Cloud Foundry? Okay. Um, in the next five to ten minutes, Josh will come and will actually show you in a demonstration. But Cloud Foundry has a, a CLI. There is a few uh, principles that you work with it. So the main principle is CF push, the magic CF push, where you do have an artifact, you upload the bits to the cloud, and then the cloud will provision a file system for you. It will provision the runtime, and then will schedule that workload in a container and will run it for you. And then you can interact with it scale it up and down uh, vertically or horizontally, add more memory, add more storage, bind services from the marketplace. 
Now, how easy it is from a developer perspective. So this is Java code. Don't, don't blush away. It's really just a few annotations. So I annotate it as a Spring Boot application that metadata shows to the Java application to run it, it's isolated within, uh, you can run it in a container on your laptop. You enable circuit breaker, you enable discovery client, and that will, uh, will trigger on the class path that you will have either a Hystrix dashboard to consume the metrics uh, from Turbine, which will, will push all the metrics about the status and health of your application. And very similar how a circuit breaker in your house, if the application malfunctions, it will open the circuit breaker so it doesn't fry your platform or your house in, in the same time. And discovery client pings the, the service that it needs to register with a service registry and then will uh, you can bring up and down the application. So Spring Cloud Services is a Netflix OSS as a service for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Next, we suggest you once you build those applications, you need to build distributed tracing. We need to monitor, you need to make the application observable. What does it mean? It means that you need to get information about how application works, how the application is functioning, what is the health and status. But you do not need it just in a in a specific time zone. You need to watch it across an interval to be able to judge is the application behaving better or worse. Because a snapshot in time is not that important. Of course, it's good you know, to know the status at the instant, but you should know at the life cycle. Because when you are updating or patching your software, this will give you insight. Is the new release better or worse? So we do have this PCF metrics, which is a fast feedback loop gives you a live stream of 20 hour, 24 hours of data. It's a dashboard that you just get if you install your top of one. The next one is zipkin tracing, which gives you operational visibility, distributed tracing. So you have all these calls with time spans and IDs, and then you can look across all your microservices. Where actually is the bottleneck? So if you go to microservice architecture, you will notice that suddenly you have almost like a crime investigation. Like where is the actual problem? Next, you need to think about API and API management. So uh, we have route services, which you can plug in. You can literally create a route service and bind it to application that will do filtering or security or rate limiting or data analytics. So it will inspect the payload that you send to the API and do very smart uh, API management for you. Route it. Uh, we do integrate with APG. Uh, if you have questions, definitely grab me after this talk. We'll, we'll go into more details. Next is data flow. So we believe that once you build those microservices, there's definitely data that it's Happening. And that will be the subject of uh, the third talk by my colleague Carlos Queros. But in a short while, this is literally what you need to set up a data microservice or orchestration. So it's still a Java Spring Boot application where you register the module and then you create a stream. What means to create a stream is very much like how you create a pipeline of where the input and the output goes uh, for the subsequent services. Ultimately, if you build a good experience, if you have an application, then you will have demand. Then you'll have feedback loop, feedback from your customers. Then you need to iterate on it because the value of an application is to continuously improve that experience. It doesn't work if you have four releases a year. If you have four releases of year, a year, then that means you only get feedback during that time, which is really, really slow and you'll probably get out of the business. And I know four releases a year sounds really interesting for folks who do one release per year. If you are there in the room, you know, it's better to look for another job. So what actually means to, you know, that feedback loop? So this is the cycle of software. You begin with an idea, you write a story for it, you build some software, you run that software on the server, and then you got the feedback. Once you got the feedback, then you improve, you patch and update your story. 
So we believe that there is actually a, a portfolio of products and the pivotal umbrella that will help you do that. And I give a talk which is more um, exhaustive. The title of it is Keep Calm and Push Applications as Service. Because ultimately, if you build custom user application, you should, be, you should have the freedom and flexibility and confidence to just push them to a cloud and worry about how application business logic works rather than all the tedious bits of configuration management. So you write a story, you can use Pivotal Tracker, which has been in a while. It was built together with Google engineers in 2000. You develop the code, obviously, with Spring. You deployed the code on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Why? Because Spring has this amazing umbrella. You have Spring at the core. You have Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, but don't forget there's Spring Batch, Spring Integration, Spring, Spring Data uh, Ready, Spring Data Cassandra. You have Spring Social. You have Spring Security, Spring Batch. All of those are meant to get out of your way. And if you need any configuration to interact with those uh, applications, you just grab and develop that experience in a Spring Boot application. But microservices are not an island. It, they don't work by itself. Like I know we've started doing Hello World applications, but soon enough in, within your portfolio you'll actually have multiple services that need to be orchestrated, need to be managed, that work and communicate with each other. And that's where I believe Spring Cloud Services will help you with those distributed patterns. And I'll have Josh speak more about it. We do have a hosted, we do have a dedicated Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but we also have a PCF Dev, which stands for your developer experience. I have one PCF Dev on my laptop, running uh, within a virtual, within a VM. And all these containers, it's actually the same software that powers our distributed uh, platform but now runs within images because there's less resources on my laptop but the contract is the same it's the same experience i go to network.pivotal.io product pcf dev it's literally a plugin that i add to my cloud foundry cli then i simply log in it's on my local local pcf dev.io i can push the applications i can get information about uh, application, I can scale, and I can even remotely SSH to debug and trace. And this is you know, just a screen if you uh, start PCF Dev. Once you deploy it, you need to build a pipeline. What we recommend is this Concourse CI, which was built originally for testing and continuously integrating uh, libraries and components from our Pivotal Cloud Foundry. But it's independent from PCF. You do not need to run it in PCF. Actually, you can run it again on a laptop. I have a vagrant image <coughs> of Concourse that I use for demos. There is one that is being deployed that runs all the pipelines for uh, components within Cloud Foundry. So ultimately, I think you have this circle, circle of code. But more importantly is you need to repeat the circle over and over again. And the existence of it is because our namesake, Pivotal, is actually from this consultancy company called Pivotal Labs, which has been existed for close to 30 years in, within Silicon Valley. And the founder, CEO, wrote me, is now the CEO of Pivotal. And he has a great talk, which I, again, advise you all to just review it. It's a 10 minutes walk about, talk about state of mind, uh, where Silicon Valley it's not just a place in the world where it can actually be transpected because there's a set of practices that you need to do, set of ideas and expertise that you can uh, move and even create within your enterprises. We do have customers who, once we worked on, on, on the platform, they asked us to build a very similar Pivotal Labs within their uh, company. We do have a presence in Singapore, Again, I'll not be able to cover a lot about Pivotal Labs, but you know, this is the details. Currently, it's uh, Craig Road. Um, we do some of our meetups there, so they are a very nice bunch of geeks that like to work on the software. So with that, I would like to close. Ultimately, the, the goal of this presentation is not to overwhelm with uh, the catalog of products of 
what we do, but really to start a conversation on let's build something meaningful. Yeah. I would like to help you to build your custom application so that you stay in business, so that you make money, so you make a better product and remain relevant. Thank you very much. Um, I can take a few more questions. Jade? Um, is Josh around? Yes. Hey, buddy. Da 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 da. Da 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 da.